everybody can hear me? Cool. All right, so as introduced, I'm Megan Tillman. I'm a rising fifth year PhD candidate at Rutgers University. I work with Blakely Burkhart, and today I'm going to be talking about the Lyman Alpha Forest and how we might use it as a constraint for ABM feedback models. So, as usual, you might be asking, why should I care? Let me ask you how many times you've heard or maybe you've asked, what about ABM? And you never get a satisfying answer because ABM feedback is very poorly constrained, and that's because it is a multi-scale problem, like many things. You go all the way down to subparsec scales for the accretion depth, up to megaparsec scales where the furthest jets could reach out to the IPM. And different ABM feedback models can produce very similar galaxy statistics as well. So you can see five different subgrid models here that all reproduce galaxy statistics uh, pretty decently. Um, but they do have very different boxes. So that's why many people have been recently trying to constrain ABM feedback with larger scale statistics. So more often now you have people using groups of the plus pair uh, as constraints. You have people looking at ABM effects at the CGM in the case of small part due to the availability of observation. And even out to the IGM, and that's where I come in. I'm looking at the Lyman Alpha Forest. So just to briefly go over what the Lyman Alpha Forest is, because many of you might be assuming Lyman Alpha emitters, because that's most often what we hear. So the Lyman Alpha Forest is a series of absorption lines in Lyman Alpha at different redshifts, because as we have quasar light going through the medium between its host and us, different lines, different absorbers, um, absorb some of the quasar spectra, and it populates different lines, and each of these absorbers are a tree in what we call the Lyman Alpha force. And this helps us see gas that we otherwise would be unable to see because we can't detect it directly, we can't look right at it. So at high redshift, we have very consistently been able to reproduce the observed Lyman Alpha forest in simulation. So here we have the column density distribution of the Lyman Alpha Forest. The lines here are simulation data, and the points are observation data. And you can see they match very well at redshift T3 and up. And this is done with the very simple assumptions of just lambda CDM and the, a spatially uniform ionizing background, or a UCD. So two simple things, and we get great results. At lower redshift, the story is a bit different. So now I'm talking about redshifts of two and below. So first off, we only have observational data at redshift below 0.5 because we need a space-based telescope with a high resolution spectrograph in order to obtain these observations. Otherwise, the uh, wavelengths are absorbed by our Earth's atmosphere. And these telescopes that we have only go up to about 0.5. So that means from 0.5 to 1.8, we have no observational data available for Lyman Alpha Forest. That's sort of a blind spot for us. And with the little observational data that we do have, we have simulations struggling to match the observation. So famously, if you're familiar with this, this field, uh, the B value simulations never match observations, but you also have struggles with the column density distribution, the flux power spectrum, et cetera. So this is why many people have been looking for other mechanisms that can resolve this disconnect between simulations and observations, and that's why I'm looking at ABM feedback, and I'm not the only one to do so. So there are some difficulties with doing this, however, because there are degeneracies in the Lyman Alpha Force that we need to address. So because we are able to assume photoionizing equilibrium, and that the Lyman Alpha Force is an optically given medium, we have this very nice scaling relation of the optical depth and the column density of the absorber, density squared, inverse of the photoionizing rate, and temperature to the minus 0.7. Simple physics, very nice, right? But degeneracy is, of course. So the photoionizing rate, uh, this is put into UVB models, so this is fairly simple. The temperature is a bit trickier because it can be a lot of different things. So you have photo, uh, photo heating rates in your UVB model that uh, contribute to this temperature, but you can also have anything that heats the surrounding gas around galaxies, so this can be AGM or stellar feedback, 
which are intrinsically coupled and need to be constrained together, or any other non-traditional heating mechanism, like maybe cosmic rays. And so this degeneracy is going to take a lot of work to kind of disentangle. Um, it's going to take a lot of IBM statistics, not just on and source and cross-correlation studies to disentangle because the UVB itself is not the best heat strain. So unless we somehow get the capability of adding proper radiative transfer to our cosmogens and still resolve the forest, this is just going to continue to be a struggle for us. So today I'm going to be talking about results from SIMBA. And there's a couple reasons that I am looking at SIMBA for this work. One of them being that it has a very dramatic ABM feedback model. So this is a nice kind of extreme case for what ABM might be capable of in affecting the Lyman Alpha force or the IBM. So let me briefly describe the feedback model. There's a high accretion mode, uh, kinetic mass loading outflow, known as radiative feedback. And then there's a low accretion mode that has two different kind of submodels in it, where one is the jets, where you have kinetic bipolar jets that are heated and briefly decoupled to prevent artificial dampening. And you have X-ray injections that accompany jets in stellar mass dominated galaxies. And I highlighted the jet feedback here because this is really where we're seeing all of our effects on the Lyman alpha force very clearly. So another reason I chose SIMBA to look at is because it has a very nice set of simulations that isolate the different feedback modes. So there's five different simulations, and one of them has no feedback at all. I'm not looking at that. That's boring. Um, then we have one with only stellar feedback. Not very physical, but it's, it's there. Then we add in just the radiative feedback, and then we add in the jet feedback, and so on. So what this does is it allows me to isolate exactly which part of the ABM feedback model is causing what changes we see in the Lyman alpha forest. And if you uh, run simulations, give me some more, please. I'll look at your same computer. All right. So I'm going to be specifically talking about the 1D flux power spectrum today. There are other statistics that I've looked at in different papers. Go read them. This is the 1D Fourier transform of the flux fluctuations in the Lyman alpha forest, or the Fourier transform of this equation. Or in English, it is how much variation do we see in the Lyman alpha forest on different physical scales. So if you worked with power spectrum before, it is pretty similar in that the small k's are associated with large physical scales, and the large k's are associated with small physical scales. So it's a little bit unintuitive, but that's what you get when you work with Fourier transforms. All right, so what do we expect to affect these different parts of the power spectrum? So at these low k values, where you have large scale effects manifesting, you're going to affect, uh, expect to see changes to the photoionizing rate manifesting here. That'll shift up and down based on how much more ionization you add to your box. And really, any ionizing effect will appear here. Um, and if you have a very dramatic effect, you're going to have an overall normalization shift of the power spectrum. So it won't just be this end here. There will be a full shift of everything, including the high k. So for the large k values, you have a couple things that are going to affect it. One is pressure smoothing. So this is really going to change if you have a change in your average temperature of your cold diffuse gas in your IBM. And then the other thing we're going to look at for line out, of course, is thermal broadening. So this is on the scale of individual absorbers and the temperature increases or increased turbulence in them that causes the broadening of their absorption line. Okay, so now that I kind of went over that, we're going to look at the actual results now, finally. Um, I'm going to be showing you ratios of the power spectra, and it's going to be the ratio of the different feedback mode compared to the stellar feedback only simulation. So this black line is stellar feedback only. When we add in radiative feedback, you can see down here, temperature changes, you actually get an increase in power on the small kn. And that is because stellar feedback is actually suppressed when you add in radiative feedback, and but we have an increase in power, which means that stellar feedback is somewhat ionizing the forest, 
And when it's suppressed, it can't do so as much. And that's why we have this gain in power. It's a very small effect, though, less than 10%. It probably wouldn't be very effective. The biggest change we see is when we add in the jet. You have a lot of ionization happening with this introduction of heat. Remember that scaling of temperature to the minus 0.7? Oh, boy. Um, this huge shift down from the increase in ionization. And at this uh, high Km, you have the uh, thermal history changing, the average temperature of cold increased gas changing, and thermal broadening from individual absorbers becoming hotter. And adding in X-rays is about the same, except we don't have the cold diffused gas temperature change. We just have the thermal broadening. So now that I went through one redshift with y'all, don't get overwhelmed. I'm showing you all the redshifts at low. Low Z, where we have observational data. I've added in shaded regions to show the observational error and uh, observational data on top of the raw power spectrum. And as you can see, the simulations with the jets, that's a neutral one, it's a red line, uh, matches the observation very well. And this is something that Simba has consistently done, is that the line analysis statistics predicted by Simba match observations very well without any sort of rescaling. So, point for Simba. Um, we also have a this, this change in the power spectra due to AGN is greater than the observational error. So in theory, this is observable, but it's difficult because of the degeneracies between the assumed UVB and heating from light like UVB and gas. So, and this is my last slide before my summary. Uh, we're looking at some intermediate redshifts here. We don't have observational data, but I'm assuming if we can get it, we'll have an error similar to the one we have at low redshift. So say we have an error about 25%. And you can see that our effects of AGN here become observable right in the middle of our observational blind spot, right around G of 1. So, in theory, if we were to get some observational data here, across habitable world across, uh, this would be <laughs> amazing to look at because clearly something interesting is happening here in Simba in this range, but we have no way to test it against observation. Um, at least with the line out, of course. All right, so I shall leave my conclusions up here. Uh, Please support Habitable World. I really want another far ultraviolet spectrograph, and thank you. Thank you very much. We have a uh, quick question over here. Hi, thanks. Uh, Nir Mandelka, Hebrew University. This is really great work. I wonder, the reason that the effect becomes much weaker at higher Z, is that primarily because there are just fewer AGN or because the intergalactic medium is denser? It's uh, primarily because there are fewer jets. And the uh, radiative feedback mode in Simba is purely kinetic, not thermal, so you really don't have um, an effective AGN when it's mostly the radiative. But the, whatever effect you do have, do you see it in the dense filaments as well, or is it mostly in the kind of diffuse, like, voids or, or, or sheets or what, what, whatever? I haven't looked at that. Um, I assume if it's reaching out to the diffuse medium, you're going to have some sort of effect in the denser filament. Um, but I haven't looked at, like, climate limit systems or the LA. Thanks. Any more questions? So I was wondering, um, the, um, uh, so you said that uh, the jets are decoupled for some time. Is there some kind of feeling for how, how critical this is? Yes. Um, for cosmic sims, it's very low resolution. And if you don't decouple, it's just going to kind of blow apart the galaxy. Um, so we did this with stellar feedback. We visited the common practice with stellar feedback models to decouple the wind for a moment. Um, but not a lot of AGM feedback models do it. And I don't know why. It should be done more. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you again.